Hello, this lecture is going to cover the early years of the Civil War, specifically 1860 before the Civil War broke out, to 1860, the end of 1862. Um, 1863 is largely considered to be a turning point year. That is when the Battle of Gettysburg happened. That's when the Emancipation Proclamation took effect. Um, so this is going to focus on those earlier years. And we'll talk about the final years in a later lesson. Lincoln was elected in 1860, even though in many of the southern states he didn't even appear on the ballot. And people saw in the South saw his election as the end for their way of life, specifically slavery. And so between December 1860, after he was elected, and February 1861, before he took office, before he was about to take office, seven states seceded and formed the Confederate States of America. Some slave states referred to as border states, remained with the Union, but tentatively, couldn't decide at that time whether or not they would stay. So these were states like, at this time, Virginia, Maryland, Tennessee, uh, had not made the decision yet to secede. And Lincoln took office on March 4th, 1861. Basically, what happened after Lincoln took office, he made it clear that he wanted to preserve the Union. He saw the Confederate States of America not as a country, but as rebellious states of the United States. And he maintained that throughout the entire war, that they were rebellious and that that was not an actual country. The U.S., of course, had several forts and munitions holdings all throughout the South. And one of those forts, Fort Sumter in South Carolina, South Carolina, by the way, was the first state to secede, as we talked about. But one of those forts needed to be resupplied. The Confederacy demanded the surrender of the Union troops in Fort Sumter. And basically, Lincoln had a decision to make. Do I surrender? Do I hold my ground or do I fire first? Lincoln always made it clear that he did not want to start the conflict between the North and the South. However, he did say that he needed to resupply the soldiers there and that he would not surrender. But he said he would send a party that did not have, uh, did not have munitions, did not have any guns or anything like that. So basically a peaceful party to send supplies uh, such as food to the the troops within Fort Sumter. And so Jefferson Davis, who is the, as we already learned, is the president of the Confederate States of America, he has a decision to make too. And ultimately he decides to give the order to fire on Sumter. And this is a crucial decision because this is the start of the Civil War, is the firing on Fort Sumter. Interestingly, no one actually dies in this first opening battle of the Civil War. This is the Civil War is the bloodiest conflict the United States has ever been involved in, including World War II. And the first opening battle actually had no casualties, except for one horse, one Confederate horse. But with the firing on Fort Sumter, the Civil War began. And after Fort Sumter, the states of Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas all vo vote to join the Confederacy. So now that the war has begun, it's important to talk about the basically how each side would be approaching their strategy to the war. And there are still some border states that are deciding whether or not they should stay. So Maryland, for example. Washington, D.C. is part of, it's cut out of the territories of the states of Maryland and Virginia. So Virginia had decided to secede. That gives you an idea geographically um, why Maryland is considered a border state. So they still had slavery um, and they, they also, the District of Columbia butts right up against it, butts right up against it. So you know, part of Washington, D.C. was bordered by a state that had seceded, and part of it was bordered by a state that was seriously considering whether or not it should secede. But basically, the South approached the war in more of a defensive 
way. They wanted to be an independent nation, so they felt like we just have to hold out long enough for the North to get tired of the war and give up. The North, on the other hand, they have more of an offensive approach. They're trying to restore the Union, meaning their goal is to get the Southern states to surrender so they can reincorporate them into the United States. So the South more defensive, the North more offensive. Strategy-wise, the South wanted to get support of Europe because a lot of their cotton exports go to Europe and they felt like Europe was dependent on their cotton exports and therefore might be sympathetic to them. Uh, so part of their strategy was to get support of Europe to hold out long enough for the North to tire of the war and to just keep playing defense, basically, to stay one step ahead of uh, the Union. The North, on the other hand, they have to take a more offensive approach. And so they wanted to do a three-pronged approach, basically. So the, the three portions of that approach would be to blockade southern ports. Because the South really doesn't have a navy. The Union does, and they can use that to their advantage. So they want to block blockade southern ports so that they cannot export their goods. And that's what the southern economy relies on, is the export, the exportation of namely cotton and other cash crops like tobacco, indigo, rice, etc. They also want to get control of the Mississippi River because that would cut the South in half. That would, well, not quite in half, but that would cut the South off. Basically, trade would not be able to, the South wouldn't be able to trade down the Mississippi River. And the Louisiana and Texas, for example, would be cut off from the rest of the South if the if this Mississippi River was controlled by the Union. And finally, they want to, the third part of the approach is to capture Richmond, Virginia, because that's the capital of the Confederacy. Okay, so here's a look at a map. The blue states appear um, as the Union states, and then the red states are border states. You've got Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, and then the gray states are all Confederate states. So, And this is what I meant by the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River, if the Union were able to control it, would cut off Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas from the rest of the southern states. The first Battle of Bull Run in July of 1861 was interesting in that most people at the beginning of the, this war did not think it would last long. So interesting is the fact that spectators came out to view the first battle. So people dressed in their Sunday best out for carriage rides brought picnics to watch two armies fight it out, basically. But it was very clear by the end of this battle that this was going to be a long war and that people did not realize the magnitude of the conflict that we were getting into. So it took place in Virginia, about five miles outside a town called Manassas Junction, which is relatively close to Washington, D.C. As I said, people from Washington, D.C. came out uh, in their carriages to view the battle. But 30,000 U.S. troops took on the Confederates, outnumbered them. The Union has way more population than the South, as we've already talked about. And that means they have a lot more people in the Army. And so in most conflicts, they outnumbered the Confederates. Uh, and it's going to be interesting, as you'll learn, the way that the Confederates were able to defeat them, even despite having lesser numbers. But at first, the Yankees, also known as the North, also known as the Union, seem to be winning. But the rebels are able to rally mostly around uh, the Confederate general Thomas Jackson, who at this battle got his nickname of Stonewall Jackson, as he's better known for, because he was unflinching in the face of the Union front. And people referred to him, look at there, look at Jackson standing there as a stone wall. And that helped inspire his troops. And eventually the Union does lose that battle and they have to retreat. And this is absolutely a shock to the North. They did not think that they, they thought the South would be pretty easily defeated, and of course they weren't. Lincoln, after this battle, appoints a man by the name of uh, George McClellan to be the general in charge of the East. I put easy, sorry. Uh, in charge of the East part of the Army, or also known as the Army of the Potomac. <clears throat> 
So this gives you an idea. Washington to the north, Bull Run, the Union troops came down from Washington and met at Bull Run, which is uh, in Virginia. In the west, in April of 1862, you had a decisive battle of Shiloh. It took place in Tennessee. It's two of the bloodiest days of war for for the entire Civil War. And it was basically a fight over control of the Mississippi River in that area. It was a narrow victory for the North, and there were huge casualties that shocked both sides. Combined 23,000 uh, on both sides, which is just enormous, especially considering the population of the United States at this time is not nearly as high as it is now. But this was a big step for the Union towards controlling the Mississippi River. So this is Tennessee here. You can see the Mississippi River off to the left, and you can see where the Union troops converged with the Confederate troops. The Second Battle of Bull Run, because why not fight a battle in two places, took place in August of 1862. Stonewall Jackson captures Union supply lines, and the one of the Union generals, General Pope, surrounds Jackson and is able to assault him, but Jackson is able to fend him off, even suffering heavy, heavy casualties and being outnumbered. What the Union doesn't know is that Jackson has already sent for reinforcements from another Confederate general, uh, General Longstreet, who is the right wing of Robert E. Lee's army. And together, they are able to crush the Union and the Union retreats, which is another disappointing loss for the Union. The Battle of Antietam, because the Confederate army led by Lee has been so successful in their battles in the South, he decides to make a foray into Northern territory. So again, the South, their main strategy was to fight a defensive war. And at this point, they, they go on the offensive. They only do this twice during the war, this time at the Battle of Antietam, which they lose, and then again at the Battle of Gettysburg, which they lose. So neither of their forays into the North were successful. And the, the Battle of Gettysburg is, is widely considered to be the turning point of the war. But at this battle, the Battle of Antietam, Lee decides to move into Maryland, which is still part of the Union, even though it's a border state. He split his army, hoping to confuse the North, and the Battle of Antietam is the de deadliest single day of fighting that took place during the war. Lee does have to retreat. <clears throat> even though both sides suffered high casualties, it is considered an important victory for the Union. And it's after this point that Abraham Lincoln decides to draft and declare his Emancipation Proclamation, which then is going to take effect in December of 1863, which we'll talk more about in the next lesson. So this gives you an idea. This is just right inside Maryland, uh, right by the border of Virginia. So it's he didn't go very far into Northern Territory. And then the Battle of Fredericksburg takes place in December of 1862. This also takes place in Virginia. A lot of these battles take place that we're talking about here take place around Richmond because, again, part of the Northern plan was to try to get Richmond to fall, to get control of Richmond because that's where the Confederate government is. So a lot of the battles are going to take place around this area or at least a lot of battles in the East. The Confederate Army is entrenched in high ground. The Union attacks are consistently repelled. There are huge Union losses in this battle, almost three to one, and the Union has to retreat. It's devastating, and this is how December of 1862 closes out. The last thing I want to talk about is war in the West. And basically, things in the West are going much better than things in the East. So a lot of the battles we were just talking about are taking place in the East over in the Virginia area. In the West, however, things are going much better, and that's due in part to the leadership of Ulysses S. Grant and some other things that we're going to speculate about tomorrow. But <clears throat> in the East, New Orleans eventually falls, and the Union controls almost all of the Mississippi, reaching one of those war aims, which is to try to cut the South off uh, using the Mississippi River, cut off their trade, and also cut off Louisiana and Texas. And again, here's just some of the troop movement. You have what's going on in the East over here, and then the West. And then these are just some things I want you to consider. Union losses are demoralizing. There are many calls to end the war. High casualties are shocking both the North and the South, and there's a lot of question as to whether or not Lincoln will get reelected.